Hey guys, so today's episode is slightly different. Um, it's taken from a Twitter space that I've done um, over the last month or so where I was talking to people that really work with creators to be able to enable them to build the things that they care about. And I wanted to package this as authentically as possible by basically not doing any edits, but also making sure that you have the full experience of a Twitter space um, we're testing these out on the podcast and we want to see what that might look like. So please give us feedback, um, share your review, share your DM, um, whatever it takes, just to give us feedback on what this, you know, might be. Um, if you feel like this is something we should definitely test more of, because it does enable us to open up the floor to be able to make the podcast more than just my own perspective, but also not just the perspective of the guests, but be able to bring you into the process of creating this podcast. So please do give us as much feedback as possible, but here's this full space um, very much focused on the legal parts of building out your business and what that looks like. So please enjoy, but also share as much as you possibly can with the people that this could impact as much as possible as well. Thank you so much for listening. Had a super good day. Um, Super excited about the work that I'm doing right now, but like also feeling very nervous as well. I think that the end of the year is such a very high pressure environment and like high pace. I feel like I thought everyone would be slowing down at this point of the year, but everyone's speeding up. I don't know what's going on this year. Everyone's just super excited to like keep working, which is like freaking me out. I'm really, really worried about that. I see Tabani just joined. If you feel this space is adding value to you, please do share it. Um, We are going to be focusing on the creative journey, um, startups and small businesses, how you set yourself up from a legal perspective and how you navigate the legal and contractual parts of your creative or small business or startup journey. I do think these are super important topics, especially with recent events. We've seen some really crazy contracts um, on Twitter lately. Contracts that I think like, yo, I think the mafia would be like, wow, that is aggressive. That is aggressive. What is happening here, right? Like, that's the kind of contracts we've been seeing. Um, But more so just like creators being in like really difficult situations because they might have, they might not have understood what they were signing or the deals that were in front of them weren't necessarily the kind of things that were as like equitable. They weren't fair in any way. So Let's have the conversation. Um, If you feel it's adding value, please share it. Um, This is Connect. So today we're connecting with entertainment lawyer Tabani, who hosts a really amazing space, um, usually on Mondays. So today he's not hosting one um, because he chose to be here, which I appreciate. I want to say that I appreciate your time. I appreciate your attention. And there's an Arsenal game on. So I, I want you to know that I really want to be here. I, I, I genuinely really want to be here. There's an Arsenal game playing right now that I probably, like, I'm going to regret missing. But I think this is super important. So let's get it. Let's make sure this is a really, really good one. Engage, um, take part, join stage. Let's ask questions and, like, let's really, really get into this in the best possible way. Tabani, how are you doing? Greetings, greetings, Mesh, and yeah, greetings to everyone else. Man, I'm doing well, man. How are you doing? No, I'm feeling strong. Um, long day, but feeling good still. Um, what kind of day did you have today? Yeah, you know, these these days are crazy. Sometimes you think that you're going to have like a relaxed Monday or very chilled Monday, and then all of a sudden you get hit with a bunch of work. So, you know. It's it's unexpected, but you know it's it's always good to to be in demand, you know, and and to be busy, I guess, you know. So as as much as it is a pain sometimes, but you know, I just appreciate the fact that there is work to do. Would you be Would you rather be uh, overwhelmed and busy, or have it be quiet and like uh, things be difficult? And I would ask if you can please don't. And don't mute your mic anymore. Um, I want to have a flowing conversation. I think like the mute unmute actually like stops the conversation in little bits. I, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. 
Um, yeah, you you always prefer it to be to be busy, high paced, and all of those sort of things, rather than it being quiet. You know, because when it is quiet, you know, there is things like anxiety that comes into play, and all of those sort of things. So it's it's always better for it to be high paced, demand, and you know, busy, and all of those sort of things. So yeah, you know, you you you, you got to take uh, the the. The good from it and the, the good from it obviously is is working, is opportunities, is growth also and, and just expanding yourself, seeing what you can do. So definitely I'd prefer to be in demand. Definitely. Cool. So let's get into your journey, right? Um, how did you get started? How did you end up in this career? What does it mean to be an entertainment lawyer? Yeah, you know, it's 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 very interesting because I, I get asked a lot because um in school um you would find that there's not a lot of courses that, that do entertainment law. You'd find more media law and all of that. So I always get asked is is entertainment law the same as media law? What does an entertainment lawyer do and all of those sort of things? Um but before I get into that, I think as as far as my my journey is concerned, um I'm from Peter Marisburg, a small town um, in KZN. Um, I moved to Johannesburg, I believe, in 2017, um, just to to pursue and broaden my my legal career. I started. Um, I actually have always been unorthodox, so I I started off um, while well, studying law, and then at some point I opened up a. a a creative design studio with like my friends and stuff because I've always had a passion for um, creating and the arts and all of those sort of things and you know it was to the frustration to like parents and all of those things once I was doing that and I think I also dabbled in mediation because I felt like that was the path and also I just had hated the stereotypes of of lawyers like lawyers being expensive lawyers you know, robbing people, lawyers, and all of those sort of things. So I've always tried to find different ways to provide illegal services. Um, so yeah, so after after I finished my articles, I just moved straight into corporate after that. Um, I didn't really have ambitions of of practicing. Um yeah, because I think I think with practicing, the one issue that I had with that was, you know, you had to put your your morals aside at certain instances and you know act at the best interest of your clients and it would always conflict with me you know those sort of things and yeah I, I prefer a more corporate environment environments where I'm pushing a purpose rather than just trying to win you know and and practice was that practice was winning you know and yeah so from from doing my articles once I completed my my articles I then moved to the South African Council for the Architectural Profession as a legal and compliance officer um that that role was was very interesting you know because i think what what that helped with was was one i got to learn a lot about architecture i got to learn also about like the arts and just i guess like drawing you know how complicated drawing is and how much time people put into drawing and just the beauty of architecture and buildings and all of those sort of things so that that role was was tough, you know, but I used to find those joys and, you know, seeing, you know, great designs, great architecture and, you know, all the consideration that goes into to drawing and all of those things. Um, from there, uh, you know, I, I I was fortunate enough to to be called as the, the head of policy and regulation at the ICT SMME chamber. Um, my role there in policy and regulation um, is basically what we do is we lobby governments um, on behalf of SMMEs in the ICT sector. The ICT sector is, is you know, run by monopolies. So we, we all know um, the MTNs, the Vodacoms, you know, Telcom has now overtaken Cell C, but we haven't really seen an, an SMME like really blow up into the space, you know, so what what we've been trying to do is is to get that and to get SMMEs in the in the space, you know, and and to provide regulations to protect them once they are in the space, you know. So it's it was a very interesting role. It was a very passionate a role that I'm very passionate about because I have a great passion for you know SMMEs and you know just startups and people that are trying to you know get into sectors. 
and and all of that. And I think um, from there, you know, the, that creative bug never left me, you know. And as much as I'm not a creative and I, I don't see myself, you know, doing any of those sort of things, but I felt like, you know, the the experiences that I did learn from practice, the experience that I did learn from corporates and from lobbying governments, I just decided to to start a, a legal agency by the name of Josela Zoom. Josele Legal, I apologize. And there, I think, you know, my my main aim was to to look at creative struggles and and provide services for creatives. Like I think the the disconnect that comes in is that you you find a creative that you know has the potential of monetizing their work, has the potential of being big, but they they just can't afford, you know, legal advice. They can't afford you know, to have a lawyer and all of those sort of things. So my my main aim was to create a company, you know, that can provide those services. Um, with with a law firm, the, there is a lot of red tape. There is a lot of um, things that you need to adhere to, too, because if you, you would probably see that you wouldn't find lawyers advertising today, it's 50% off or today, you know, whatever. And that's because of the, the ethics that come with the profession and and being able to uphold those ethics. And as much as, you know, I would never want to be a person that that just pushes um, sales and, you know, I don't want to say cheap advertisements, but that pushes those sort of agendas. But at the same time, you want to cater to your clients. So with Josela Legal and just having friends and a bunch of people approaching me, a bunch of creatives, I'd say, approaching me with those issues. I wanted to to create um, a company that can provide bespoke services to creatives, but still maintaining, you know, a certain level of um, professionalism, you know. So um, I think that's what I, my goal was to create when I started uh, Josella Legal. And, you know, from there, you know, which is what I'm currently doing now, you know, it's 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 been a very awesome journey. It's been a tough journey, too. And, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm currently doing. Thank you so much for bringing um, that really good intro and context. I hope that everyone trusts you now. I always think um, that first question is really so that everyone else knows that you are not, like, bullshitting. Um, it's a really important, like, laying the foundation. This guy knows what he's talking about, and I really appreciate it. Um, just the first sort of off the back question. Um, what do you think that most people are not taking care of this part of their business? Why do you think um, it, it it goes, you know, set aside, um, push to later? Like, when you start think of starting a business, that's not the first thing that you think about. When you think about being a creator, that's not the first thing you think about. You're not thinking about the legal ramifications. Should you set yourself up as an entity? Should you formalize things? Should you um, be able to protect yourself from a legal standpoint? Those aren't the first things that come to mind. Why do you think that is? And also, um, maybe you can go into what you think is the best, smartest way that someone can set themselves up um, when they're starting their journey to make sure that it's a much easier path going forward. So, yeah, um, I, I think as, you know, as far as um, the legal considerations, when it when it does come to, um, I won't just put it down to creatives, um, SMMEs, founders, startups, people that are starting businesses, is that it's, it's not really a, a quote some quotes um, sexy thing to do, you know. What 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 is sexy is to 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 get a, a PR, you know, manager, a PR agency, get marketing down, get the photographers, take the picture, make sure that you you know your website, your content that you're putting out is looking, you know, fly and all that. And you know the the legal stuff is is, is stuff that you you don't really think about, especially if there is financial constraints. And you know it's it's unfortunate. Because a lot of the times what happens is that, you know, people, I won't say that they get away with things, but they don't run into a lot of legal issues. And when when you do go ahead without considering all the, you know, the legal ramifications that, you know, come with, you know, starting a business, you know, registering a company and all of those sort of things, um, 
you you later down in the line you can you can be faced with a major lawsuit you can be faced with if if you're not taking care of also like your tax and your financial concerns you can be faced with a major tax bill also so you know it's it's administrative work and administrative work isn't sexy it isn't you know nice to do what's nice to do is to set up your business market it and to get customers and get them in you know but you know, there's a lot to to think about. You know, firstly, like with registering a company, you know, it's it it sounds like a simple thing, but people tend to to start influencing and trading with their own personal name, and they they run into issues with that too. You know, I I even I always encourage like influencers and creatives that you know you need to you know create or register a, a company in which you contract with. And, you know, I always tell you that I know nothing about finance, but I think the, the, the tax implications is a big reason for that too. By setting up your, your a company, instead of, you know, transacting in your own name, you do protect yourself from a lot of tax concerns. You know, there's a lot of um, tax, tax write-offs and rebates that you can get you know, as a, a, a company instead of as an individual and the tax is just way higher when you are contracting as an individual. So those those are sort of things that, you know, people see down the line when they do get hit with those tax bills, when they do get hit with, you know, a, a, a bill. And now, you know, since someone is suing you in your personal capacity and now you hit with the situation where this person is going as far as to... um. Uh, so you invited me to call us. So I don't know if that's going to. Yeah. OK. But yeah, to, you know, it's it's it, it hits you down the line. So, you know, it's it's very important because also, you know, when when you are in the, the public domain and when you are transacting, there's a lot of considerations. You know, I had a, a, a Twitter space about the legal considerations for online businesses that I did. And, you know, funny enough. I could tell that people didn't understand the importance of of how you 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 manage your the data that you collect. You know, as far as people's personal information, the data that they have, and and all of that. Like we, we see all the time with Facebook and WhatsApp, currently the 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 fines that they're getting for their mismanagement of data and you know private information, and you know the the reason why you need to focus on something like that and you need to have a great understanding with that is that, you know, before, and I'm saying pre-July 2021, you know, you had to sue a person. So you had to take a person to court when, when you had those issues. Currently now, the information regulator and the Poppy Act is running in full force, which means that if you mismanaging someone's private information, if you do have leaks, um, with someone's thoughts and private information, if if you sharing someone's private information without them knowing, you know, you could just be reported, and then there'll be fines, implications. You know, there's also criminal implications that can come into that too. You know, so it's always important to have that that system in place and make sure that you know those those ticks are there. So. And the understanding that, understanding exactly the importance of setting up a company and why you're setting it up, you know, it, it just seems like to me, when I talk to a lot of people, they just seem like they they understanding is that it's just a thing to do that I need to register a company, I need to do this, I need to whatnot. But the question you need to answer, ask yourself is why are you doing that? Why are you setting up this company? Why do you do you have a privacy policy? Why do you have terms and conditions and all of those? Yeah, I mean, let's just go into some of that, right? Like, what? why is it important for someone to go, you know, let me set myself up as a company. Let's make sure that the intellectual property is owned by the company instead of me as an individual. Um, how does this sort of change your relationship with the business that you do in the real world, right? So you are no longer yourself, but like a representative of the company that you work for, right? How does that sort of change the relationship in which how you engage with brands, how you engage with different people when you're working with them, when you're a representative of an organization versus being the actual being that's, you know, signing onto these things. 
does it protect you? Does it expose you? You know, those sort of um, um, aspects. Yeah, it, it, it obviously does um, protect you because um, a company, you know, is uh, its own legal entity, you know, its own separate legal personality and all of those sort of things. So, um, you know, when when people then do come after you and sue you, they're suing the company and they're coming after the company and they're not coming after you in, you know, your personal capacity. You know, and, and that's, I think, the, the first thing and the most important thing also. And also you'd find with a lot of brands and, you know, a lot of companies, whenever they um contracting with freelancers, whenever they're contracting with um, people, they they would actually want to rather contract with a company rather than an individual. And there's labor implications to that too, you know. Um, a lot of people um, tend to to forget the thing is that if if I'm contracting on a continuous basis with a company, you know, at some point someone can then push to be defined as an employee. You know, and the rights of uh, a service provider and the rights of an employee are drastically different. And companies try to, you know, keep, um, I would say, service providers at an arm's length because they don't want to be put in that position where a person would say that, oh, I've been working with these companies on various contracts for X amount of years. And now this person is now going to decide to say that actually I'm now an employee of this company. I should be an employee of this company because of, you know, the contractual relationship that we do have. So they'll tend to, to put you at that arm's length, you know, with all of that. You'd also find like if your company is a sort of company that bids for um, RFPs and, and, and tenders and all of those sort of things that, you know, there's certain documents that have to be in place, like tax clearance, BE certificates, and all of those sort of things. So if you don't have those things in order, you know, generally you won't, you know, be able to, to get those RFPs. You won't be able to get those tenders and all of those sort of things. So it's it's formalizing your hustle by setting up a business and, and all of that. And, you know, when it, when it comes to also IP, you know, it's, it's, you know, I always tell people that you really need to have a, a sit down with a lawyer or someone that's knowledgeable about IP because there's a lot of misconceptions when it does come to IP. And, you know, with those misconceptions, you know, it leads you down the path of what we're seeing now, you know, what you think you. Yeah, um, I just want to interject there just so that like, we can split the conversation and then we can go into IP. Just like, to, just to track back, right? So I go to CIPC, I register a company, right? Um, private company, obviously. And then I basically employ myself in this company. And in any sort of business I conduct as a creator, people are working with the company as me as a representative. And this would sort of at least create some structure as well as some protection for me as an individual. Is that sort of like where the setup is at that current point? And then also, what's that next step that comes after that, right? So for me, what I've realized is like, yes, a few people might know this information, but they might not know, hey, this is where you should go to go think about much more deeply. What does it actually look like to set yourself up from a legal standpoint to separate yourself from the entity and be able to like, um, execute things in a much more professional manner and in a way that doesn't leave you exposed. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And it's 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 that arm's length thing of of just separating the 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 business obligations and the business concerns from yourself to to make sure that you know there is that that protection because a business you know has legal capacity which means that a business can contract in its own name can trade and contract in its own name can buy and sell assets and enter into agreements in its own name you know and and that does you know protect you as an as an individual or as a business owner in that you know there's there's, there's so many you know possibly you know legal things that could happen um lawsuits possible lawsuits possible um you know, attacks from, I guess, also information regulators, um, various other regulatory bodies, you know, when you are trading. And 
to not have a business, you open yourself up to all of that, you know, and the the practice that you see a lot of people is that when when the business does crash, you know, there's there's also if you talk to finance people like foreclosure, not foreclosure, sorry, bank bankruptcy, you know, filing for bankruptcy where the company cannot meet all its demands and all of those sort of things. And when when the business does go south, also, you know, they they liquidate the the business and the business assets instead of sequestrating you. You know, and and sequestration is is the the toughest thing an individual can go through, in 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 my you know in my opinion when it comes to finances because in that instance you'd find a situation where you know you cannot meet your 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 obligations or your payments or any of that and whenever you start a company you need to have that in the back of your mind that you know you make it to the point where this company may fail and you can't meet your obligations. And now, since you are dealing with various other companies, since you are dealing with various other entities, you know, they just, they're not just going to stop at suing you and, you know, you having a bad credit record. They'll go as far as sequestrating you. They'll go as far as, you know, blacklisting you, all of these sort of things, you know, listing you on ICT and all of that. And when, when that does happen, then, you know, it, it gets to the point where you can't even get a cell phone contract. You know, because of all these payment obligations, these credits that you have against you, you know, you 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 tied up in the middle of it, you know. And even looking at like, for example, marriage, you know, like you, you speak to any lawyer these days, they'll they'll always push you to to getting married out of community of property. And the reason for that is that you know, at least one partner you know, can take the risk. And if that partner then sinks, at least the other partner can still get credits. At least the other partner can still, you know, participate, you know, with, with other credit agreements. But when now you both married in community of property, now you both tied to these issues. You both can't buy anything. You both can't, you know, so with, with the company, you got to consider that, you know, at least Rather the company get get blacklisted, rather the company get liquidated, then you get sequestrated. Because when you when you're going through those debt reviews, sequestration, all of those things, they'll appoint someone to handle your affairs, you know, and and that's that's a terrible thing. You know, I, I had clients where money would come in and you know there would be someone appointed who would then decide that okay. X amount needs to go to your creditors, X amount needs to go this way. And, you know, this is the amount that we feel that you can live off. You know, something very impractical, something, an amount of money that you could never live off, but they've determined, you know, that this is what you can live off and this is what you are going to live off. You know, and when you put yourself in that sort of bind and that sort of position, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough thing. So you, as much as you you believe that your business can can thrive, your business will thrive and all of those sort of things, you, you've got to have at the back of your mind the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario is that you don't meet your payment demands, that they do come after you and they don't stop coming after you, you know, and all of that. So rather than take the the assets of the company and all of those things, then now your your house is being auctioned, your property is being auctioned, you know, you you you've got garnishes now against you too. You know, and 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 that's an example of when a person goes to the extent of, you know, informing your employer that this person, you know, has this debt obligation to me. And before, you know, I can get paid, you know, the employer has to pay your creditors first and take that money out before they pay you. So now you are again a child, you know, being being taken care of and you can't handle your own financial you know, finances. So it's, I think it's it's just important looking at it from um, a worst case scenario. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for um, braving through that. I actually vanished, had to close Twitter because it just like completely shut off. But because you're so good at this, you didn't even notice, which is great. So we've spoken about setting yourself up and really like creating that environment and that separation, creating that but also just being able to manage things in a much smarter way. When you start thinking about um, much deeper what we've seen in recent events, you know, people signing contracts where intellectual property is allocated very differently to what, you know, most people might think of. Um, how do you think about how creators relate to intellectual property um, from a legal standpoint? And do you think that 
the understanding of what it is and how we can actually manage it or own it or register it is very misunderstood. Um, and also, if you can, give us an education around that. So, you know, and and we were just having this conversation um, um, today. I was having a conversation with this, like, as far as, you know, people that consider themselves to be brands and influencers and all of those sort of things. So if, if for example, you know, I'll start with, you know, brands and influencers. If, for example, you're a brand, that means that your name has commercial value to it, you know, and if you, you're not protecting that and if you, you know, those rights attached to, to your name is not being protected, you know, you're opening yourself up to exploitation, you know, and you see it in instances where, you know, companies have trademarked um, creatives and, you know, personalities' names. You know, and now a person can't now use their name, you know, in, in, in other, you know, commercial, you know, ventures or whatnot, because a certain company now has ownership of your name and all of those things. And I think for any person in the public domain or whatnot, whatever the name is that you go by, you know, whether it is your government name or the name that you that you use as a, a creator, whether you being an artist, actor, or whatever, um, I would advise that you you trademark it. And you know, trademarking is basically um, it's it's a registration process where you're protecting a, a name, a slogan, or a, a trademark being something like a logo or whatever. And in doing so, once once you've trademarked it and all of that, when you're entering into these agreements and these deals and all of that like as much as they're using your name as much as they have a, a brand or a, a product with your name's likeness or whatnot you will still always retain your name you know and depending on the various contracts or the agreement that you have with that company or with that brand like you know you can then venture off to do other things and you know use your name you know, it's 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 the saddest position when now you you are unable to to you know trade with your name. Now you have to trade with a different alias. You know, I, I don't want to speak too much of these these instances that are happening on on Twitter currently, with obviously the prominent person with the champagne and all of that. But like you look at, for example, Prince. Prince, you know, whenever he would song write and all of those things, he would use aliases. And I would assume that was because, you know, the companies had trademarked that name and made sure that they that they have protection over that name and all of that. I'm not too sure. I'm just assuming. But if if you also look at like IP, since we're speaking about IP, I think the starting place that you need to know is that in anything that I'm doing, like what intellectual property rights come from this work that I'm creating, you know, whether it be uh, copyrights, whether it be uh, trademark, as, as, as I was just talking about, or whether it be patents, and also understanding what that is. You know, with, with patents, you're dealing with innovations and all of those sort of things. So if you feel that what you've done is an innovation, you know, whether it be a technical, technological innovation or, or whatever the case may be, you know, it's it's always good to, to then get that patents protection. And you know, it's it, it just boils down to when when you do then contract with the company is that, you know, instead of now the company now owning your innovation and owning your trademark, you know, they have to now license it, you know, or enter into an option agreement where they they have the rights to it for a specific period, but they never, you know, retain full complete ownership of it too. You know, another thing also is like copyrights and with copyright, copyright protection is automatic here in South Africa. You don't have to register copyright, but there are exceptions to that too. Like if you, you, you've you written a film script, for example, you would think because it's something that's written down and, you know, it's, it's, it's a literary work that it's, you know, it enjoys automatic copyright protections, but film scripts have to be registered, you know, and, and if you, you do not understand that and if you don't do that, you know, people will then register your work having seen that it isn't registered. And now you're in a bind of, 
you know, you have to take this person to court and prove a bunch of things, which a lot of us don't have the capacity to then, you know, take a major organization to court and, you know, sue orga major organizations. Yeah, so, so the natural question that comes after, especially, like, the many types of, 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 of things you just mentioned, so, like, you mentioned uh, patents, copyrights, and trademarks, all of them very different in their own different ways. But like the natural question that comes for someone is like, okay, if I'm making digital content or I'm licensing my name for a product or if I make content for a brand, where is that actually covered? And also, how do I actually register each one of them? I know this is not going to be able to be like a super detailed answer on a Twitter space, but like, is there sort of one, two, three, hey, here's how you register a copyright, or you said that we don't really need to register it in a formal way, but, like, what does that look like from a trademark perspective and then um, that last on the patent perspective, which is, like, the technology and going much deeper. Um, again, just before you answer that question, thank you guys to everyone um, that's been sharing the space. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. It's really great to have so many people here and be thinking about these things because I think that, Everyone here will take something away that they can impart on someone else, which is like the most important thing. And then thank you for sharing the link. I've been seeing like a bunch of people doing that. Please ready yourself. If you want to come on stage and ask Tabani a question, please come up because I do not want to monopolize this conversation. Um, I want us to have like a really meaningful discussion that can be impactful for someone um, that might be going through this or has seen um, this happening to other creators and wants to protect themselves in, in some way. So, Tawani, um, please go into those three. How do creators actually use them, leverage them, make sure that they're protected at each time? So, yeah, um, so with, with copyrights, for example, anything that you've written down, um, you know, any picture that you've taken, um, yeah, it, 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 it enjoys um, automatic protection, but... Now, what you, what you need to figure out is, you know, how do you then prove or how do you then show that, you know, you the original creator of that work, you know, and 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 that's where it starts off is that you need to you need to be able to show that in an event that someone then infringes upon your copyright, someone then writes the same thing that you've written, someone then steals your written idea, you know, your concept, your picture, and all of those sort of things, you know. And, you know, we 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 bless now with internet age is that there's a lot of, like, um, digital receipts, I would say, that, that do have timestamps, that do have dates, that show dates, and all of those sort of things. So it's much easier to show exactly that you, you've, you've, You've drafted something and you're the first person to draft it. You know, when when I speak to like up and coming musicians that like write lyrics and all of those sort of things, you know, other than registering the song at Samro or Capasso or Samfra or all the other um, collecting agencies and all of that, like, you know, I'd always say just email the lyrics to yourself. You know, and so you do have that that time date, that's time stamp to say that, you know, these these lyrics were written by me at this time, at this date, you know, and you have that prima facie proof, you know. There's there's a guy that I've interacted a lot with, um, Eugene Mteto, and he he speaks openly. He's he's the he's one of the members of Trompis. He speaks openly about these things. So I know he wouldn't mind me talking about it too. But you know, back in the day, what he would do was he would post his lyrics and uh, uh, like a USB with the, the sound recording of, you know, his song to himself and just leave it at the post office, you know? So when that, you know, that contentious then does happen, he can then go to the post office and, and show those dates, those times and all of those things. So you can already tell like how complicated it was, you know, back then and like all that efforts versus just, emailing things to yourself and you know you know saving things in various ways that that does have the time dates and all of that so you need to prove that you know firstly that it is your original works you know and originality also you know is is it's not clearly defined in the copyright act and you know there's there's various reasons for that because you find that you know whenever i speak to to 
whatever I hear, I would say creative speak is that there's nothing original anymore. You know, everything is taken from something else and recreated and all of those sort of things, you know, but you need to, you need to then show that the way that you've put together your contents, the way that you've put together your profits that has been originally put together, you know, and, and, and show the courts or show whatever, person that's contesting your copyrights that it was originally put to that too also and just understanding it too you know like the the big thing now with with photographers and visual content is nfts you know and and people just you know they 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 don't take interest in those things because they don't see it being prominent here in south africa and you know it just seems like another forex type thing or another whatever but you know, and I, I hear it a lot, you know, that a, a person would, you know, take a picture that's then used, you know, on a major platform or that's then, you know, used, you know, for great commercial value. And you, the person that's taking the picture, you know, number one, you don't even know if you own that copyright, you know. And secondly, even if you own that copyright, you can't even prove that you do own that copyright. So again, you need to look at the worst case scenarios that if someone takes my picture, if someone uses my picture on a various forum, how can I do that? With NFTs, the beauty of NFTs is that it does have an ownership digital footprint in it. So whenever someone then uses um, or sells that picture and all of that, and it has that digital footprint, then you can tie in and say that, you know, even though that picture was sold, you know, you still retain a certain percentage to it being sold in perpetuity, you know, and, and that does help, you know, in instances where, um, let's say, for example, you, someone commissions you to do, um, whether it is a movie or take pictures and all of those sort of things that you do then have, you know, that digital footprint to say that as much as I may not be the the, the controller or the, the outright owner of this copyright, I still have, you know, that royalty that I'm supposed to get from that digital footprint. So if something eventually blows up, you know, that you do get something, you know, and you won't be that guy sitting on the couch and saying that, you know, I used to, I took those pictures, I took that, what's what, I designed that thing, but, you know, you like, you like low, low malum and, and thing. In, in a log sheet that constantly says that, you know, I used to play soccer with this ning ning and you'd all like, then what happened to you, Malume? Why aren't you why aren't you why aren't you falling? Why aren't you? Yeah, so I think I think you, you've got into like a, a completely different world, right? Like now you're not just talking about like the very traditional way that people think about intellectual property, which is mainly like I make a script, I make a, a video, I make a song, I make a piece of work, and I try to protect it in very traditional means, but in a more digital way. Like, maybe go into what an NFT is from the start, like just from base level, what an NFT is, and how people can actually leverage this new technology to start thinking about how they own and can protect their own art, but also monetize it in a much, much, much smarter way, but also possibly much more um, rewarding as well. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll I'll be honest in saying that you know I'm not uh, I'm not an expert when it does come to, to NFTs, but an NFT is you know it's, it's a non fungible token, but it's 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 a digital footprint, you know, in in essence. And you know what does that does do is that when 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 your audio, photo, or, or video is being sold or used or whatnot, that there is that digital footprint connected to it and whatnot. And and also, you know, I believe it's it's a way for you to track exactly how or where your 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 content is being used and and being moved, all of that. So for example, let's say you can't track it and you can't keep up with it, but now you've been notified of it. Now you, you, you're then in a position to, to have that prima facie evidence, which is evidence on the face of it to say that, you know, I, I in perpetuity, no matter what happens, even though this, this 
um, content was commissioned and was paid for and is not necessarily owned by me, that I always get a royalty from it whenever it gets sold, whenever it gets used, you know, on a platform, whenever it gets licensed and all of that. So, you know, and the more, you know, and I, I think we'll also speak to like the regulation of, you know, the, the creative sector, but the more that people start using these sort of mechanisms and using this technology and all of that, you know, then comes the, the regulation of it. And when we get to that stage, then you'd get to a stage of, um, for instance, if someone is now using your picture, your audio, your video, that, you know, instead of quote unquote, now having to sue a person, taking them to court and all of that, that you can refer it to that regulatory body to say that. But however, if, if we're not as, as creatives, you know, taking, taking into account all those considerations that, even though I own the content, even though, you know, I have this, this royalty in Pippet, you know, this royalty that I'm supposed to get forever, whenever the, the work is sold or whatever, um, you know, I, I just don't have the money to take this organization or this person to court, you know? So it's, it's until we get to the stage where we can now push technology, where we can push these ideas of protecting our IPs, we, we're going to continuously see people being exploited, you know, and, and people being robbed of their, their creation and their work. So, you know, it's, it's something that I think, number one, that we need to inform ourselves by, we need to learn about it, we need to think, but we also need to push governments to create regulation on it, to say that, and even if, because we, we had a, a huge debate, I see Dumi is also here, we had a, a huge debate and I just loved her passion when she was speaking uh, to me with the why. But, you know, even if it's self-regulation where we say that, you know, as photographers, as filmmakers, as musicians, that, you know, we've identified this company or this organization that can then regulate, you know, all of these things and keep stock of it. And if one of us, you know, then messes up, you know, then we can be brought to that organization and all of that. And what, you know, will then happen is that we'll create a culture of, you know, voluntary associations to say that I'm not going to work with Utaban and Gisela unless Utaban and Gisela is being regulated by this organization. And if he's part of this organization, I know, number one, that he's going to adhere to certain standards you know, I know number two that he's is his practices are going to be in accordance with this voluntary association, all of that. And number three, that if he then is in breach or if he then um, is does unethical, you know, practices and all of that, instead of suing him, I can take him to this regulatory body. You know, as lawyers, we have the legal practice council, as accountants, you have your regulatory bodies, engineers, you, you, you have it, you know, all of those sort of things. But as, as creatives, we don't, you know. And the reason why I push for voluntary associations and self-regulation is that, you know, and I've had this conversation with you also, is that I don't think that, you know, the people in parliament fully understand the arts and you can just see it's in the way that they support it, you know, and you can just see it's in, you know, the, the, the things that they push and the things that they ignore. So if, if we're going to trust, you know, governments, if we're going to trust these government agencies and all that, you know, we're leaving ourselves, you know, in a compromised position instead of putting ourselves and saying that, listen, as, as photographers, we're going to sign up with this and, brands and whatnot, we're not going to work with people that aren't signed up to this voluntary association that doesn't adhere to these, this code of conduct or these ethics or these, you know, principles. And then you create a, a very comfortable culture of working with each other because there isn't, you know, these blow ups that are happening on Twitter where now, yeah, you did this, you did that, you did what, what, now you can just take your, your agreement, your contract, your understanding that you have with that person and refer it to the voluntary association. Yeah, um, I think there was talk of something like this for podcasters um, late last year, but 
it's quieted down now. I really hope that it happens, actually. Um, but, guys, open um, session now. Um, if you want to come up, ask Tabani a question, um, please just put up your hand. I'll accept you, put you on stage. You can ask a question because I am happy to go the whole time with just my own perspective, but I am much more happier if someone else that has sort of a question around creative or startup and like how you can set yourself up from a legal perspective or navigate that space, um, please come up and we'll just ask the questions and, and really try and get as much out of this as possible. Um, Tabani, just like one last question from me. Um, and I hope it's it, it's something that like you can really speak to. Um, with recent events, you know, just like the terms and conditions of contracts being ridiculous, right? Like some contracts being, you know, mafia level or even like Sugar Knight in his prime, right? Like you're looking at it and you're just going, why would a creator sign up to this or like be allowed to be exploited like this? But, you know, you can also say from a different perspective, you know, maybe I just didn't know or I didn't understand. And like, I, you know, I didn't have the capacity to actually assess what I was actually signing up to, right? So what are the things that creators can start to do to empower themselves and enable themselves to navigate those fields where a contract lands on your desk and they're saying, hey, look, here's the money. You see the money, but like, hey, you're not going to read all the terms. How do you navigate that space as a creator, you know, very early on? Are there resources I can go to before I go to, hey, Tawani, I've got a contract in front of me from a brand. Can you please help me like go over this, understand it so that when I sign it, there's full confidence that I won't be exploited. So before I come to you, is there anything I can do as a creator to arm myself, to be better placed, to, you know, sign these contracts with some confidence? Um, how do I empower myself to better navigate those things? But also um, you can go to, go into sort of the services that you offer for creators to really be able to navigate this part of their journey. Uh, thanks so much, Mesh. Um, so, you know, and, you know, funny enough, when, when I think about this and, you know, I feel like this is a, a question that you should also answer because when I, when I look at the various platforms and, and, you know, companies that you then have, I feel like you, you provide a lot of information for um, startups, for people starting their things and a lot of considerations too. So I think things like um, the, I think it's called the, the founder's source. Um, and, and all of that, you know, it's great platforms for people to, to then go on and, and equip themselves and all of that. But, you know, what, what I provide for a, a startup, for example, or anyone that's, that's uh, you know, establishing a business or an online company and all of that is, you know, the, the first thing I'd always say is that if, if you do have concerns, you need to sit down with a lawyer because as much as there are resources out there and all of that, they, they generally speak to issues, you know, and there's a lot that you may miss and there's a lot of, you know, things in your company that opens you up to a lot of things. Like, you know, the, the general acts that I find, you know, with, with creatives, or, or startups, for example, is firstly like the Poppy Act, the Protection of Private Information Act, you know, and if you have a company, for example, I was speaking earlier about, you know, data protection and internet censorship and all of those sort of things. If you do have a company and you're trading online, there's legal things that you need to adhere to. And, you know, you look at the Electronic Communications Act also, it speaks to this thing too, you know, and if you don't adhere to it, you can't be reported, you know, and it's not even an instance of someone suing you, you can't be reported. So from end to end, you know, you need to show the customer that exactly, you know, when they are buying things, when they are revealing personal or private information, how is that information being handled? Who are you sharing this information that, that you are acquiring? Is there a payment gateway that you do consult with? Is there third parties that you do consult with? This is important to know because if you do not disclose this thing and there's a breach, you know, from the payment gateway or there's a breach from a third party, then you will be held liable, you know, as the person who has received the that private or personal information. So it's it's very important that you understand and you create a, a, a very effective privacy policy. And the privacy policy speaks to that, so that 
all your information gets gathered like this. As soon as I receive your information or whatnot, it will be kept private and not disclosed unless with your consent. It will remain private to this thing. However, you know, I do have payment gateways, you know, who I share this information with, who adhere to the same standards. I do have third parties also who I share this information with that I do, you know, adhere to these things. You would see now on any website that you go into, that whole thing of accepting cookies is a big thing too. And if you're not doing that and a person's private information is being taken or whatnot, it opens you up, you know, as as uh, an online trader to being reported to these various government agencies. And it opens you up to fine and even criminal action. And also just like with the internet censorship, you know, the contents that you're putting out, you know, does it adhere to the laws and the regulations that are out there? Are you creating what could be considered as offensive you know, contents that infringes on people's rights. You know, you need to make sure that you, you do adhere to that at all times. We're speaking about intellectual property. There's the Intellectual Property Laws Amendment Act. There's the Copyright Act that speaks to intellectual property, you know, owning intellectual property, how intellectual property is established, whether or not that intellectual, pro intellectual property, sorry, has to be registered and all that. That needs to be considered too, and that needs to, you know, be known to that too. A lot of things that people overlook also is consumer protection laws, you know, that you find in the Consumer Protection Act. You know, do you have a refund policy when it comes to your works? Does your work have to have a refund policy? Is your refund policy, you know, in line with the Consumer Protection Act? Because if it isn't, you'll run into those issues and you'll run into instances where you are now being reported when people are suing you because you're not adhering to that. You, you, you're not being transparent, number one, when it's coming to your services. Number two, you do not have a refund policy. You do not have assurances to protect the consumer. Consumers are very protected, you know, in South Africa. And if you do not make sure that, you know, whatever you're selling, whatever you're producing, you know, is in line with the Consumer Protection Act, that the consumer is always protected, you open yourself up to a lot of legal liability and a lot of actions. You don't make sure of that. You know, another thing is, is tax laws too, you know, which is very, very, very important, I would say too, is making sure that you adhere to those tax laws, making sure that when you are transacting, when you are, um, quote unquote, receiving large sums of money that, you know, all those tax considerations are made. And I think the, the biggest problem that people have is that they, they come with that arrogance of, you know, I heard or I watched the YouTube video, so I know, you know, and and what that then does is put you in a position of, you know, opening yourself up because the person that's helping you would think that you know what you're talking about and then provide you a service, but you're not protected end to end, you know. So you need to be saying whenever I speak, you know, to to the bookkeeper that I use. Like, I always come as an ignorant person. You know, I always tell them, like, yo, dude, like, what is this? What is this? What is this? I'm constantly asking questions. I'm like, also, I hear that this, you know, what, what does that mean? What does, you know, all of those things. And I, I make sure that he's able to answer those questions and do those things for me. So, like, with the services that Josella Legal provides, the legal road mapping, we see from conception that, okay, from from the, your, your tax concerns, from your, your data protection your, your privacy policy, the terms and conditions. You need to remember also, if you're trading online, there has to be some sort of agreement that you enter into with that person. And if you don't have that agreement, again, you open yourself up to all these laws and you know regulations and all of that. You would find, for example, if you're buying a take a lot or you're buying from one of these online traders that you always have to click to terms and conditions. You know That's not by mistake or anything. That's because they have to bind you to a binding agreement. Some people just have disclaimers, but disclaimers don't cure all the liabilities that you open yourself up to when you are trading, you know, um, online or you are trading. So it's it's very important to have that, you know. And when you do sit down with a lawyer, and you can then see from from starts from selling, from from when a, a customer is also unsatisfied with the work that you are doing is that, you know, how am I protected? 
you know what protection do, do i do have you know i I, I always speak about like breach clauses and whenever I look at contracts, you know, that's, that's the clause that frustrates me the most because, you know, and I think a lot of people don't ask that question is that I have this contract and this contract states that if, if this person infringes upon my copyrights because this contract says that I retain my copyrights, this person breaches this agreement, they'll be in breach and what's what I'm done. But you need to ask yourself what happens then, you know? What happens then if someone, if someone, if that company takes your copyrights, if that company, you know, if you have a confidentiality, confidentiality clause, if you have a restraint of trade clause and that is breached, what happens? What are the ramifications of that? You need to ask your lawyer. You need to ask, you know, whoever's assisting you that question, because it's one thing to, to have a breach clause, but it's another thing, you know, to have an enforceable breach clause, you know, and when I was in uh, a practice or whatnot, the most frustrating thing is sitting in front of that, standing in front of that magistrate and trying to explain, you know, the intention of the parties and why this person is liable and all of those sort of things. And then also, if you look at, you know, things like issues that we see now on social media, especially because we speak about creatives and whatnot is that if if you have an instance of you know defamation if you have an instance of someone you know using your name or whatever in a bad light and all of that you know how do you come to a figure you know people have just been hitting that 500,000 thing to say that yeah now I'm going to sue you 500,000 for doing this and all of those sort of things and whatnot. But now you're going to sit in a situation where you have to now quantify that. And how is it going to be quantified? How, 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 so you need to now sit down with a lawyer to, to understand exactly, you know, if, if now someone then uses this, if, because I have this intellectual property rights and whatnot, how will I quantify it? What are the steps that I need to take in order to, to, to come with a figure to say that this is the amount you know, that I'm seeking and realistically, this is the amount that I can get, you know, and many a times you see that, you know, lawyers will say that, okay, cool, let's, let's go to courts, whatever, we'll sue them for a million, chiki chiki, you get 30,000. Now you deepen legal fees. Now you deepen, you know, all of those things. And, and there's considerations that you didn't make, you know, because you've just been speaking to someone and making assumptions to say that, um, because I have this contract, because I have this clause, I'm protected, and I feel like I should get 500,000, I feel like I should get this, but the court doesn't care what you feel like, you know, the court cares about actual damages that, that do occur also. And also, you know, the action that you can take against a person, you know, for example, if, if a company like, um, let's say, like a company like Netflix, you know, steals your concept and all of those things. Is it in your advantage to, to hit them with an interdict and, you know, then sue them? Or is it more in your advantage to maybe say that, listen, what I want is credit and I want what they call a reasonable royalty from this content that's being used, you know? So you need to unlock yourselves to those possibilities too and understand that, you, you know, you do have those actions where you can actually ask for a reasonable royalty to say that, okay, cool, I don't want this content to be taken down because this content is on a major streaming platform. It's being used by a major artist. It's being used by a major online, whatever streaming platform, you know, but one thing I want, number one, is credit for the work. Number two, I want a royalty, you know, for it to, to, to continue, whatnot. And then you can broker that deal with, with that infringing party, the party that has infringed on your, on your copyright. But as long as if we, the conversation stays that this is what I own and, you know, I, I want what's mine, you know, you're going to have a lot of trouble. And, you know, when, it, when, when these claims run into the hundreds of thousands and the millions, it can take years years and years and years to get your money back for for example sorry to, to stop i just want to hit this point before i stop if you look at the the vodacom please call me guy that dude i think it's it's over 10 years that he's been going after vodacom and he's he's been pushing it and he's and he's whatnot the courts then told um vodacom that listen you need to come up with an amount 
um, you know, to pay this guy because he's won that case. But now they 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 trying to figure out exactly how much he should get from you know that that situation. And Vodacom is saying I'm not too sure exactly where they're at now, but it's tens of millions. And you know he's produced so much to show that this product is worth billions. So now this guy has been back and forth in the courts for over a decade trying to you know get you know quote unquote billions and all of those sort of things so when you when you are protecting yourself when you are trying to create that coverage or whatnot you do need to sit down with a lawyer and have that in-depth conversation you know like it can't always be at a surface level of do i own it or do i not own it you know that breach clause, you know, how how can how enforceable is this breach clause? How do we enforce this breach clause? Is it is it feasible for me to enforce this breach clause and all of that too? So, you know, that's that's the sort of things that that I look into when when people do then approach me, you know, with their startups and all of those types of things. Is that you sit down and you have that conversation where um, you look at it from end to end, all the rights. That, that come up when you are creating your products or your content or whatever. And then you look at the protection that you do have. And then you also look at the action that you do, that you can take too. Because if you you now have this right, but you have to go to the high courts, you have to, you know, brief counsel and all of those sort of things, you know, you, you left in a bind. So I think it's it's very, very, very important for 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 creatives, for startups, business owners to look at it in that light that from, from, from me getting the money that I'm supposed to get, how do I get that money? What's the frequency of make, me getting that money? You know, and, and also if I'm not paid that money, if my, my copyright, my, my intellectual property is infringed upon the action that I can take and the, the likeliness of success also, you know, in taking that action too. Well, I don't know about everyone else, but you you scared the shit out of me. And maybe this is the problem, right? Like creators, entrepreneurs, small business owners, at the very beginning, this seems like the very big hurdle. Like it's very scary. It seems like very, you know, opaque. It's very difficult. And I think there's room or place for someone to try and make it more accessible so people don't feel so like, terrified of it because everything you just said is like oh my goodness i don't know if i ever want to sign any contract ever unless i have the right person to go through it and really help me understand it and like really see the blind spots which most creators um probably experience but we'll take some questions from everyone um in the audience i don't know how much time you have but like unfortunately you you've you've really gone into detail which is a good thing so we're just going to try and like push them as, as quickly as possible. So first person, uh, Neo, um, please ask your question. Uh, thanks, Jens. I'll try to keep it as succinct as possible. Ne? Um, so with regards to legacy and looking at the context of South African creatives, uh, creators and how they end up, which is the media paints it in a in a quite a bleak lighting um so if you pass on no, is it better for or or rather how is it framed for 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 the family and how do they benefit from your work is it better for them to to have had a creative that built their 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 organization because uh, you said earlier on that if you're going into any freelancing work, you need to build your business and operate as such. Is it better for the family to have had the creative who built the business or is it easier for them to reap from your work after having passed on as an independent individual? Uh, yeah, that's what my question is. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. And, you know, uh, you know, um, with with intellectual property, um, your your heirs can inherit from that and can reap the benefits from that. There's, there was that huge thing in I think it was a, a Netflix video to um, what is it called? The Lion's Share, I believe it was 
where um, the 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 creator of that that song, I think it was Hambumbe or something like that, and you know it was it was then created to Wumbawe and all of those sort of things and and whatnot. It was remade into various ways, and they eventually won because they were able to to prove that and whatnot that their father, you know, created this work, and now as the the rightful heirs, you know, of his estate that they should be benefiting and getting those those royalties and all of those sort of things. So definitely 100% your your heirs can can reap the benefits but again you you need to now look at it from a, a deeper level too as to for how long can I reap the the benefits of this and how is it set up to ensure that my my heirs when when I do pass away know about these rights and know about how exactly these these the, the royalties for this intellectual property whatever it is is collected you know and and that's you know I, I think it has to be detailed you know so so that your heirs understand that and so that your heirs know exactly what to do you know when you do pass on and also you know it's 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 not black and white to say that because you know I own this content that is going to pass down to my heirs you would find in a lot of instances, you know, um, people would, would set up uh, structures or trusts is the big one, where since you're a beneficiary of the trust, you know, you then reap the benefits of whatever the shares are, whatever the royalties are, and all of those sort of things. But then they put in conditions of those trusts is that if you're no longer a beneficiary, if you die, if you, for whatever reason, that it does not cede to your heirs. And and maybe also they'll say that there's requirements, you know, to be part of this trust and all of those sort of things. So you, you just need to make sure that, number one, you know, there is intellectual property in your work, that you own it or that you are getting a royalty from it. And then number two, if I do then pass, are those royalties, are the, isn't that intellectual property going to pass to my heirs? which is a big thing because people just think that it's going to happen automatically. But there are instances where people have been finessed. And, you know, if if you're going to make assumptions and think that just because I'm the owner, just because, you know, uh, you know, I, I receive these royalties, my children get royalties, you know, you do open yourself up to that finesse of, you know, these trusts that were set up where you benefit from them, but then when you no longer the beneficiary, no one else then benefits or whatever other structures, these companies are very, very smart, man. They're very, very smart. So when you do have that understanding, you need to then sit with a lawyer, you know, or sit with someone that's knowledgeable about it and have that conversation. So ask them straight up, ask them that, listen, if, if I then do pass, does this property, does these rights, these royalties, then seed to my ears, you know, and then you'd be in a more comfortable position. Thank you so much. Um, Makamu, you can ask your question. Um, uh, th thank you, Mesh. Uh, uh, good evening to the listeners. Uh, good evening to uh, Tabani. Well, uh, my question will actually go back to what Tabani was talking about uh, regarding registering your company. So what I wanted to understand, I just wanted to get clarity on this. When you register a, a, a company, and this is because you're trying to uh, maybe protect yourself from um, any uh, situation that might come through uh, along the way. So when you register a company, um, you're registering the company under your name. So how, how then do you get protected um, from, from any, uh, what do you call these legal situations in that sense? Because, because I feel like... Um, when you register a company, it's just about the same as, you know, buying a car and putting it under your name. So if there's any uh, legal situation that is going on and people want to sue you and they're coming for you, so the company is still tied to your name. Um, what I want to understand is how do we get to a point where we say there's a separation between me as an individual and the company when the company is actually registered under my name? That's what I wanted to understand. Yes, how do you like alleviate the personal liability of registering the company under your name? Yeah. Cool. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, so as as soon as you 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 register a company, you know, there is that 
um, a, a company is its own legal entity and has its own legal personality, which means that a, a company can contract and enter into agreements as, as much as a human or natural person can do also. And a company can incur debts and get credit as, as the same way that an individual does too. So, you know, from, from the gate, you know, there's that separation. So it's you and then it's the company, you know. So as once you have a registered company, there is that separation automatically or from the start of it, you know. But also what you need to consider is that a lot of times when you are getting um, into credit agreements with uh, organizations and all of that is that, you know, they do understand that fact that a company is a separate legal entity and that in order for us to get our money back, that we will have to um, then sue the company, liquidate the company and all of those sort of things. And the, the directors or the shareholders of the company then go scot-free and maybe set up something else. So you would find that a lot of companies, you know, when entering into credit situations, sign the directors or the shareholders as surety. And basically what happens there is that you then, you know, sign as what they call co-principal debtor, which means that you then also responsible for the debts, you know, that the company is incurring in that specific situation that, that you are entering into. So as much as you, you do have a company, there's ways that people then bind the company to the directors, to the shareholders of the company also. So it's, it's also important, you know, to, to have that, that deeper conversation with a lawyer or with a person that understands companies, that understands corporate structures and all of those sort of things um, to, to make sure that there is that separation, to say that um, this individual can go after the company, can sue the company, take the assets of the company, but they can't go after my personal assets and whatnot because you will find a situation, and especially um, if the individual is successful and the company does bad and there is a surety agreement and the person has signed as a co-principal debtor, that they would skip the company and go directly to the person and sue that person in their personal capacity, you know, to squeeze that person. So, you, you need to make sure that you do have that separation between the company and yourself. And if you don't, you just need to be completely aware of it so that you are more cautious in the, the, the deals that you're entering into and the, the credit obligations also that you're entering into. Thank you so much, um, Aqua, and then uh, Piano Man. Now it is, um, asked what I was saying like before, like basically, uh, uh, Tabani has answered what I was asking about, like separating your yourself from the company and your personal liability not being connected. Um, oh, okay. company, yeah. So, okay, cool. No worries. Thank you so much for coming up, um, guys. I don't know how much time Tabani has, but like, can um anyone else please request? I think like we working through some stuff. I am scared um, that some of the stuff might make um, people feel a bit, um, what's the word? Um, threatened, not threatened, um, intimidated. Like some of this content does feel a bit heavy. It feels like very complicated or opaque, but I really hope that like there's things that you're taking from this and going, okay, this is how I can sort of change how I navigate things and this is how I can sort of design my business better and like my creative journey in a better way. Um, yeah. Piano man. Um, if you had a comment or a question, please do share. Yo, bro. Um, I, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say shout out to you, man. Um, you're uh, doing great stuff. Uh, Mash. Uh, these insights and these things that you put together, I think it really helps a lot of people. Just, you, when you see people do good, you just got to shout them out. I'm shouting you out. Shout out. Don't stop. Keep on keeping on. You're the man. That's all. Cheers. Night. What? I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, especially from you, man. I really, really appreciate it. I don't know if you have time for a question, though. Because I know you work in this field. Do you have time for a question? Yeah, as long as you're not going to ask me if people are dating or if they cleared their their government documents before they got tenders or... 
Uh, keep it light. No, this is not that kind of I'll, space. I'll, <laughs> if you gotta ask me about my favorite album, is sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd ask. Um, just you know, you working in a very interesting role around music, um, yeah, and really sort of that collision of music creativity, um, but also legal, um, and and you know, formalizing the work of creatives. Um, what do you think the state of you know, how creatives think about legal and like how they're taking care of that aspect of their business is. And what do you think um, more people could actually be doing better in that space? So the short answer is they're not, they don't. Like they're, the creatives only think about the legal side of stuff when it starts impacting them in some way or the other, um, usually financially. And that's why you've got a lot of especially in the black space, we've got a lot of um, practitioners with all the IP knowledge, but who are struggling to break into that market because uh, they think it's a, it's a set up shop and, and, and get going, you know, uh, start a firm and announce that you provide the services without realizing that uh, given where our entertainment industry is, you need to actually be actively involved in the, in the communities that you seek to service, you know, you need to understand their language, how they speak. I, I always kind of say to guys, we probably do 40% legal and 60% um, business advice or consulting because you're, you're, you're more invested in that ecosystem, understanding how they think, why they think, uh, how to break down legal concepts to them, uh, how to get them to understand things better. And once you, you sort of get past the understanding barrier, it's a lot easier to do work with um, people in entertainment. So we've, I think it's just the guys are, once they understand it, because at the end of the day, they're creators, right? They, they're entrepreneurs. Once they understand your value add and where you fit into the puzzle and where they need you, um, those guys kind of like get it and run. I've got like some, you know, when I was, still in private the guys some of the top clients in the country wouldn't even really look at their stuff they're kind of like okay you're the guy we trust you we understand what you're doing i just want to cover one two three four five but that's because we spent the first five years deeply in their ecosystem getting to understand them first and then getting them to understand legal so it's it's understanding spaces it's like uh, sports law you know uh guys who aren't in that sports community who aren't at the games who aren't with the administrators the coaches the you can have the qualification but you know you're going to struggle to find room scope or scale to apply it because that segment doesn't work the same way um the corporate world does so um Creatives are, they, they are, and, you know, they, they're getting more and more interested in it because there's a lot, a lot more money in it as well, right? So people are from whatever it is, if you're selling paintings and stuff and guys are looking up at the Nelsons and the Cromwells and so they're kind of realizing, okay, where there's commerce, at some point they'll have to be legal. Um, but the real appetite for them to be fully invested in it is going to be based on how you place it in the ecosystem and the value chain and how you articulate that value proposition as a catalyst for more. Because that's what artists want, right? That's what creatives want. They want more. So if you can uh, position the value proposition of, 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 of legal as a catalyst for more in a language that they understand, then that's where the, the, the bridges kind of connect. Uh, so you've got guys like who just because lawyers come at them like wearing a suit and it's like actually no you come to me at 4 p.m and i'm charging you for a cup of coffee and you're just like ah, you know what dog i'm gonna google something and we'll figure it out um you know i've had guys say to me in the early days like dog what do you mean bro <laughs> we're putting together a five million rand deal with like girel but i realized because i wasn't articulating it well enough to them so yeah I hope I've answered your question. No, you definitely have. Um, really appreciate it. Um, so, guys, look, 
um, I'm only willing to accept anyone that wants to speak that is a woman or is non-binary. Unfortunately, there's been too many men speaking in this space. Um, so if no one else would like to ask any other questions, I'm happy for Tabani to just give a final word of advice for creators to think about this legal aspect of their business. But if someone that is not a man and is non-binary, I'm happy for you to join the space. I'm not okay with just men speaking um, in any way. So, oh, man. Someone just requested, but their header is like a beach. So I don't know what's happening. Okay, I'm going to just take a chance. Cool. But yeah, guys, um, I've really, really found this very, very valuable. Thank you so much, Tabani. I think like it's been a really incredible um, learning experience and a really great education. I really hope that everyone else has felt the same and we can get those final questions in so that everyone can get the help that they need um, before we end the space. Uh, Rima? Hello. And uh, yeah, hello. I just want to thank you from where I am. And you save me a lot of, of time. And, and I'm uh, very grateful. That's it. I think everyone's very grateful today. But yes, thank you so much for coming on stage. Uh, to say that really appreciate it appreciate your time and your attention and your effort um and i just anyone one, else one more thing and i i'm finished uh, sure i may contact you by mail uh to ask for many details that's it thank you very much okay cool that's fine <laughs> i'm always open for that mm -hmm. cool thank you so much rima um, I see no one else has requested. So, Tabani, um, please, just a final word just to share around creators and like how they re re relate to this really important part of their business. Um, and then we can end. Yeah, thanks, man. And, you know, I think um, Piano Man raise, raises some, some great points and that, you know, it's it, it, it isn't just, you know, understanding the law, understanding, you know, contracts and all of those things, but it's it's understanding the sector and exactly how the, the sector works and, you know, the, the tricks of the trade and all of those things. And as, as long as you, you, you don't have that full understanding, then you, you do open yourself up to, you know, exploitation and all of that and also the the assumption that you know all lawyers understand all things that are legal is is also very misleading too you know there's there's that big case that a bunch of people have been asking me about that Timba Toby, you know um I'm handed down recently where uh, they were speaking on tacit I think it's tacit consent and you know the there, there was a huge uproar. There's a bunch of people asking and whatnot, a bunch of people chiming in and all of those sort of things. But, you know, if, if you're not uh, a person that, that actively practices in criminal law and the criminal space, and if you're not reading these judgments, you know, and the reasoning behind these judgments, you know, it's, it's, it's very... Uh, it's it's almost arrogance for you to 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 just slap in an opinion or frustration and all of those sort of things. So it's it's very important to get that that expert advice with that advice of you know a person that has industry experience. You know from from what I saw, you know speaking on that judgment, from what I saw, there were things that made me uncomfortable there. But I I can never question it because. I, I don't have that knowledge. So even me as a lawyer, I would then ask, you know, people in the criminal space and ask them, you know, when you do have these things, like what, what is the practice? What is, you know, what, what, what leads the, the courts to, to their, you know, conclusions and all of that. So even when you're speaking on like, like startups and companies and all of those sort of things, you know, like deal structuring also, you know, and, I think that's the biggest thing that I've seen on, on Twitter with these issues that we've been dealing with too, is how the deal is structured. You know, a person is, is getting royalties, a person is perceived as the owner because their name is slapped on the product or whatnot. 
But when things hit the fan, then you realize how much control, you know, the company does have, you know, and how much control you don't have and ownership and rights to the product that you don't have also. And, you know, as I, I heard you saying that, like, I'm scaring or, or whatever, but I just think it has it has to be a deeper conversation. Like, it can't be the surface conversation of ownership and all of those sort of things. And the frustration, I think, that you, you see a lot of, you know, lawyers, attorneys, advocates or whatever, when they are speaking on public platforms is that, you know, a contract can be 30 pages, you know, and a person's asking you that if I have this contract, what happens? And it's like, you know, I have to sit down with you. I have to understand exactly what you want from the contract. And then we need to talk about possible compromises too, what you're willing to compromise in and out. And also, you know, the protection that this contract has also. You know, I, I, I always say to people that a contract is a piece of paper until it's been enforced, you know. And if you're unable to enforce this piece of paper, you know, it really doesn't matter, you know, that you have the piece of paper because you're unable to hold the person to account, you know. So you need to look at ways to enforce you know, the contracts, way to enforce the rights that you do have and also that. And you need to understand, you know, the various rights that if you are a startup that a consumer has and the various um, laws or regulations that you need to adhere to when you are putting up concepts, content, sorry. And if you're not doing that, if you're not taking that into consideration, I promise you, you can run into big trouble, big, 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 big trouble. And it will be out of ignorance. The The first thing you learn low when you're studying is that ignorance is not a defense, you know, and I think, I think creatives have, have, have gone about this and unfortunately, well, fortunately the creative sector is blowing up and as it blows up, you know, there's there's all these rights that come in and it might not be right specific to um, the arts or whatever, but because you're dealing with um, consumers, because you're dealing with people that do have rights or whatnot, you'll find yourself in a legal bind. You know, you you'd find yourself with a lot of liability and all of those sort of things. You know, like I was speaking earlier of sequestration, you know, it's, it's, it's like that thing would drive you to your knees when a person is taking your assets, when, you know, you've been declared a delinquent, you know, all of these things. And, and, and now you as an individual are like, yeah, but I was trading as a company, but you didn't put those things in place to create that, that distance, that separation. And, you know, these people that you've been trading with have been making sure that you clinged on to all these obligations, all these debts, you know, that you are, that your company is entering into and in, in its name. So, yeah, you know, I, I appreciate, number one, the, the space and, you know, it, it always is an honor to be on your space, you know, and I think going forward, hopefully creatives can understand that, that you know, a YouTube video, uh, a, a Twitter space even isn't always going to help you to cover all the elements of your, your, your company or any, you know, damages that you can incur and you need to, you know, at some point sit down with someone that's knowledgeable, you know, to be able to have that protection. Thank you so much. Um, there's one more person that actually just requested um, war innovation. Um, I don't know if you want to ask a quick question and then we can wrap up. Uh, oh, hello. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, like, yeah, I sent uh, my request a couple of times. I don't know, like, I think you missed it. Uh, it's cool though. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm an illustrator. Uh, for like um, so like I create like a uh, visual art, and um, yeah, so like um, uh, they call me a creator. So um, I was approached by an American company, you know. So it's one of the biggest toy companies, uh, uh, like in, in in America, and um, they were looking for and they they wanted me to create uh some products for them, you know, because they wanna come into the African market. And but the thing is, um, they were looking for an E and O insurance or something like that. And here in South Africa, it's quite expensive, you know. Um, uh, that's what they notice here in South Africa. Like it's it's really expensive. It's more cheaper in America. Uh, so I don't know if you know about the E and e and O insurance, or um, and if you know about it, like is there like a cheaper alternative here in South Africa? I don't know. 
Thank you so much for the question. Just by the way, the reason why I didn't accept your um, request was because you look like a like it doesn't look like a person. Oh, sorry. So I wasn't sure. Um, you know, I wasn't sure what am I accepting. So I can't, you know, just make these decisions on the fly. I had to try and make sure, sure. So thank you for your persistence. Tamani, um, please give that a shot and then we can wrap up. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll be honest, and I'm not I'm not so clued up on on E and O insurances, but you know it 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 seems like um coverage that 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 covers things that aren't traditionally covered in you know insurance contracts. So I think I think what you would have to do is then have a, a discussion number one with with that company, you know, or I don't even think it would have to be a discussion. You'd have to you'd have to see exactly what they want to insure and protect. And then you need to to speak to the the various insurance companies that do offer those that that sort of protection and see if they then do compromise. You know, if if you can maybe find people in the insurance space. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I just I just got to be completely honest with you is that that's. It's not something that I've traditionally come across, but you know, you know these these insurance companies they they're very flexible. What I've noticed these days. So if if you do then have that that conversation with them, an insurance company that does provide that service, and then you you, you know you try to see if there is any flexibility with that, and maybe also speaking to that American company to see exactly what they want. And see if you know you can get a compromise between that. But yeah, no, I'll be lying to you if I say that I I, I know exactly what an E and O insurance is. Okay, how it works is like uh, so: if I create a product, if I work with the company, you know, so uh, that uh, maybe I make a mistake while I'm working on the on the product because maybe I didn't speak to company guidelines or, or rules or something like that. So. And then, so they have the right to sue me or something like that. So they want to make sure that I'm, I'm protected, you know, like I can maybe pay you for if I make a mistake or something like that, you know. So something like that. Um, that's my, you know, my, my, you know that's that that sounds that almost sounds like professional indemnity insurance that uh, a lot of like professionals have, like accountants and, and engineers and things like that have, you know, to, to protect themselves in, you know, omissions or errors and all of those sort of things. So, you know, I'm, I'm not too sure exactly if um, that service um, is traditionally, obviously there is, but traditionally provided there. But you, as I'm saying that you need to speak to insurance companies, like I, whenever I speak to insurance companies and I come and I tell them that, you know, this is what I'm looking to insure. This is what, like, they always create flexibility. They always create, because all of those people want as customers and all of those sort of things. And something like an, an E&O, as much as I'm not familiar with it, and professional indemnity, you know, that's, that's a worst case scenario insurance, you know? So if, if you can get, that insurance to the satisfaction to that company, you know, then you're in a good position. But yeah, I, it's I, I can't speak in depth of it because then I'll just be misleading you. Okay, thanks a lot. Bro. Thanks. Thanks a lot, man. Um, so, guys, just want to say thank you so much um, for your time, your attention, your energy, for being here, um, for giving yourself like the time to really like try and invest in your creative or entrepreneurial journey by being in the space, trying to arm yourself with whatever insights, learnings, and like perspective from people that can really help you. This is what we try to do um, every Monday. It's a connect section. Um, and we just try and like really distill some of the stuff about entrepreneurship and creative journeys that most people just really find, you know, maybe not so exciting. So if you found value in this, please share it. Um, Please tell people about it. We will be extracting all the audio from all these sessions to make a podcast at the end of this sort of month. So I um, made a promise to myself that I would make a Twitter space every Monday of October. And um, I think that's coming out to an end next week, maybe. But um, if you want to be the next guest, please send me a DM. I think that there's so much more we can go into. Thank you so much, Tabani. Thank you so much to all the other speakers. 
thank you so much to the gratitude that you guys showed as well by sharing the space, by sticking around, by giving your energy to this. I really appreciate it. I really hope that you've taken something from this that you can give to someone else or if it's something that you can just apply in your own creative journey, in your own business, in your own startup to try and do something that can help you navigate things much better. Thank you guys so much and hope you have a great night. Um, as a last comment, I spent all this time on the space while Arsenal were bottling a really great game and I'm really hurt by that, but it's okay. I think it was for a good cause. Thank you for keeping me here because if I was watching this game, I would have been way more frustrated. So, Thank you guys so much and cheers. Have a great night. Appreciate it, man. Good night.